Hey y'all, welcome back once again, Modern Challenges. And this is one of the most challenging talks of the Modern Challenges to the Extraterrestrial Hypothesis you're ever gonna see in your life. Um, I, I know next speaker, Joe Jordan, and I have known each other, been affiliated since the very late 90s when he first contact, contacted me. I was living in Nashville and he was living in Florida. At the time, he served as the state section director for MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, and he just investigating UFO reports as well as abduction reports on his own. He'll tell his story. He has had so many jobs, uh, like high-end credentials, working for uh, the Space Center, Kennedy Space Center in Nashville, in um, Florida since then, Cocoa Beach area. He is currently overseas uh, working for a private defense firm in North in uh, South Korea. And he's come all this way to share his findings, which have shocked and rocked the UFO community since the late 1990s. One of the most controversial guys that's ever been involved in credible UFO research. He has some credentials with MUFON. They've never kicked him out for this as well. But he's been one of my longtime friends and supporters. He's spoken here over half a dozen times. He even ran the convention for the city of Roswell in 2008. We got to select who the speakers were. So tons of credibility on who he is in the field. But again, his findings are probably the most controversial and challenging of almost many of the speakers you'll ever see talk about the UFO and alien topic ever. Everybody likes it, a lot of people love him, and a few people might even feel they owe their life to him, his work and his research and his just faithfulness. But a great friend to me, I can't say enough, but I gotta yield the microphone to him. My great friend, I love him, Joe Jordan. Welcome him up, please. Everybody good? Enjoying your time here? Yeah. I am. I'm glad to be back. Last time I was here was 2010, was it? Yeah. The last conference we did together. Um, I love this place. I love coming to visit. I uh, mainly come for the green chili sauce. Um, <laughs> they don't have that in Korea. I'm going to take some back. That way I don't have to make these trips, expensive trips to get it. But back to topic on hand. You see, the title of my talk is Unholy Communion, the Unwanted Piece of the UFO Puzzle. And the reason I call it the Unwanted Piece of the UFO Puzzle is because even though, as Guy said, I've been sharing this story for 20 years, close to 20 years, it's still one that's not wanted by the UFO community. It's not been accepted. Um, even though I'm a MUFON national director for South Korea now, been a MUFON member since 92, as a field investigator, as a state section director, now a national director, still when I share my information and my research and my work with MUFON, the replies I get from them is, did you hear that? Yeah. That's what I get, okay? So they don't know what to make of it. Um, Going to give you guys an opportunity to let you think what you make of it. I got to take you back to where it started. 1992, I was on vacation. I was headed to uh, Anchorage, Alaska. My brother was in the Air Force, living up in Anchorage, stationed up there at Elmendorf. And I had an opportunity from where I was working to take a vacation trip. I should take my young son, six years old, with me. I took my mom with me. The three of us went up to visit my brother and his wife. You know my nephews and uh, i had a week's opportunity to stay there stopped at the airport before flying out in uh, orlando um, looking to see a 10-hour flight to get to anchorage via utah and on up and i thought i need something to read on this plane 10 hours this is back before they had all the movies and stuff like they do now i think this was still back at vhs times you guys remember those days um so i went in looking for a book Magazine, book, something to read. Went into the kiosk there, started looking around. Uh, didn't see anything in the magazine that was interesting. Went into the book section. Keep in mind that as a youngster, I was an avid science fiction fan. I consumed science fiction literature. Okay, One of my favorite writers was Frederick Paul. If any of you are science fiction enthusiasts, you might know the name. 
a little different than some of the other writers, but I really like this work. I came across one book, to me, it looked like a science fiction book. I said, I hadn't read science fiction in years. By the time I pick up something and we'll start it on the plane, finish it when I get back. I looked at the book, I turned it over to read the back of it, see what the book was about, and it puzzled me. Because the back of the book read like it was scientific research. But the front of the book, to me, looked like science fiction. And the name of that book was UFO Crash at Roswell. And I had no interest at all in the UFO subject to that point. Actually, after that one. When I picked that book up, the only reason I kept it is because I couldn't understand how something that looked like science fiction was saying it was science research. The two don't match. There's a, there's, there's a fine line, at least I thought there was, between fantasy and reality. There is, isn't there? I mean, there's, there's a line there, right? But this was being blurred when I had to look at this. Like I said, I had no interest in the UFO field or subject at that time. Picked the book up, started it, and it just consumed me. I ended up reading it on every spare moment I had on my vacation and just about had it finished before I got back. Actually, I finished it on the plane trip coming back. All that did was open up a can of worms of questions that I need an answer. And all of a sudden, I'm looking everywhere to try and find out what is this they're talking about? What is this idea of alien spaceships actually coming here? You know, you're telling me all this stuff that I read as a kid could possibly be real? Come on. You know, I knew what fantasy was. And this is still sounding like fantasy. At that time, I was a professing agnostic humanist in my belief system. Okay? Uh, it's what public education pretty much does to you, is make you that way. And that's the way I turned out. That's the way I lived my life. Um, everything was nuts and bolts as far as I was concerned. Okay? There was no real paranormal. Fantasy was fantasy. That's all it was. Um, there was no real otherworldly things. I didn't think about that. I was busy working for a living trying to raise a family. You know? Uh, I didn't have time to be involved in looking at all this stuff about aliens and UFOs and flying saucers and all of that. I just was too busy. But I did take the time because the bug caught me. I had to find out what was going on here. Was this real? You know, was, was I missing something here? So I started looking at other books, started looking for other information. The internet was just getting started back then, where you could start looking for certain things. There wasn't a lot out there at the time. It started growing as the years, went, first early years went by there, where I could find more than more. But I was lucky to come, on, come across a commercial on TV for a guy that had just opened a UFO museum on International Drive in downtown Orlando. And I thought, well, I don't know. I have to go check this out. And they did a little interview with the guy and his wife. And there was a mom and pop type outfit where this guy opened up a, a virtual museum on the UFO subject. There was a walkthrough, very similar to one downtown. Uh, he had a lot of stuff in there that he had collected over the years and put together. It was in, when I went there finally to visit him and ask him questions, and I walked through his museum, I was quite impressed. Actually, he looked better than the one down here. Um, he didn't last long, though, because as soon as he got into the place where he was located on my drive, the entertainment and leisure, you know, tourism and all of that stuff was really starting to boom at that time. His rent doubled, tripled, quadrupled. Next thing you know, he couldn't survive anymore. I mean, it was a neat interest, neat idea to put in a UFO museum down there on iDrive, but it just didn't stay long enough. He couldn't keep it going with what they were charging. Him. But he was there long enough for me to ask him questions. Come to find out he had been associated with MUFON, Mutual UFO Network. He had been a state section director for Orange County, which is the Orlando area, for some time. So I talked to him about that a little bit. I said, you know, what is this about? And he said, it's the largest organization in the world, grassroots organization. 
um, not funded by the government. It's it's uh, it, it's all voluntary and you know regular everyday people trying to find answers to the UFO subject. And he said, you know, with your interest, you might want to consider becoming a member and getting involved. He says, not just asking me for the answers, but looking for the answers yourself. I thought, well, that's cool, you know, be an investigator, be a researcher, not knowing what's involved with it. But I took him up on it and I joined MUFON, became a journal subscriber. He says, next level is field investigator. Work with me, I'll get you up to field investigator status. Went out on a couple of UFO sighting reports, worked with him, understood how the process worked. Next thing you know, he says, you're ready to move on. So move on where? He says, you're over in Brevard County, right? Which is where the Space Center is located, Brevard County on the coast of Florida. The Cocoa Beach area just south of Daytona. And he says, there's no move on chapter over there. He says, you got a chapter here in Orlando. But he says, why don't you open up your own chapter over there? He says, become a state section director. That's what they're called over counties. And he says, uh, get your own group started. Bring up field investigators over you. Be prepared to answer calls coming in from the sheriff's department, police department, you know, the newspaper. They get calls all the time. People want to report stuff. And they'll direct them to you. You know, these guys don't want to deal with this. And they'd be glad to have somebody do it for them. I thought, okay, I'll take this on. So we talked to the, the uh, state director at the time, Glenn Pugh, and I had an interview with him. He said, we'll put you in the position. So next thing you know, I'm a state section director. I got my own county. What do I need to do now? As a state section director, there was a couple of requirements. Advertise for MUFON, for one. They want to get more members in, because members drive funding to help them do research. Okay, how do you do that? You hold a monthly meeting. That's what they ask for. Hold a monthly meeting somewhere for free. Don't charge. You know, we're a voluntary nonprofit organization. And uh, I said, okay, I can do that. Went to the local library. You guys ever consider doing this? You go to your local libraries, they'll let you get a room, no charge. They'll get you the, you know, audio visual equipment you can use. You know, it's, it's all there for the public to use. As long as you're not charging, they'll let you use it all for free. Uh, so if you've got any meetings you want to do, consider that. So I set up doing once a month meetings in the Cocoa Library. Put up a sign on the door, the room that they gave you. UFO meeting, free to the public. You have any idea what happens if you put up a sign like that? <laughs> you get a room full of people with all sorts of stories. It's fascinating. I had no idea what to expect. Put the sign up. Sure, they started coming in. Started working with an early group of guys, bring them up as field investigators. I had five good guys working under me. And uh, we actually started getting sighting reports. And how cool is it to be getting sighting reports in an area where the Kennedy Space Center is located? That's cool. You know, some of the reports are actually coming in from the space center. That's even cooler. You had to have permission to get out there to follow up on them, but most of the time we didn't have to go out there to do them. We do the interviews, you know, off the coast, off the cape. But we got started, we got rolling, we got doing new fonts work. But the monthly meetings are what we're interested in. People were coming to us expecting that we would have answers. We have no answers. Ufan has no answers. 70 years into this, looking at the UFO phenomenon, there's still more questions than answers. You guys understand that, right? Lots of questions. The answers aren't there yet. They're, they're just, if you think you have an answer, next thing you know, you got two, three more questions to go along with it, okay? But we did the best we could working with these people. We introduced them to the UFO phenomenon. We shared videos with them. We shared the work that MUFON was doing with them. We shared case histories with them. You know, it was a time to come together with people and have an opportunity to share a common interest like you guys are doing today. Except that some of these people had stories that were very special. 
And these were the people that we didn't expect. We didn't understand that this was part of the phenomenon at that time. But there were people coming to us, very distraught people, traumatized people, unhappy people. And these people were not the ones that had seen the bright light in the sky. But these were people that had claimed that they had had a UFO alien abduction experience or contact of some sort with entities. These people were not happy people. People that had sightings always were happy people. They wanted to share what they saw. Oh, let me tell you what I saw. You know? They're all excited, but these other people were not. We didn't know how to handle these people at first. We didn't expect it at all, but there they were in our meetings looking for answers. They wanted help. We were far from the, at that time from being able to help them. The more we listened to their stories and the more I thought about it and talked to my field investigators, I said, guys, look at this a little logically. Here we are chasing our tails following up on UFO reports because it's always after the fact that they call you up. Somebody sees something, phone calls made, investigator goes out, there's nothing to see. You're taking everything second hand, okay? You, it's like chasing your tail. You can do this forever. MUFON's been doing it forever. Other researchers and groups have been doing it forever, okay? There's millions of recorded reports out there where people have done the same thing over and over and over. If you're gonna find answers to what's going on, you gotta do it a little different. And that's when it came to me. These people, these people that were not very happy, Lives turned upside down, families broken, okay? Not knowing where to go for help. These people were claiming to be in contact through an experience, which what they believed were behind the UFO phenomenon. Well, if you think about it logically, this is the front line. You want to get some answers, why not go to the front line where the, the work's happening? So we decided to put most of the focus onto working with the abduction experiences. We didn't have a lot to go on back in that time. This was mid, mid 90s, early mid 90s. So we started consuming all of the literature that was available at the time by the top researchers looking at abductions, getting our hands on videos from conferences that they had done trying to educate ourselves so that if we're gonna work with these people, we wouldn't cause any more harm to them. That's the one thing we did not want to do. We wanted to be able to talk to them, to interview them, to try and focus on the commonalities between the experiences without making it any worse for their situations. So that's where our focus was at first. Once we got through as much information as we could consume, we thought we were ready. And then we started working with these abductees and experiencers and listening to their stories in detail. And there's a lot of them out there. The Rover Cole at that time had done some studies that had been put out that estimated upwards of 2 million people in the United States have possibly had this type of experience. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people that have had their lives turned upside down. That's a lot of unhappy people. And that's something that we knew that we had our hands full. And it's something that we decided to take on carefully and very, you know, distinctly in, in, in special ways to be able to document this. At the time, MUFON wasn't able to really get into the abduction research. It was early in the game for them to even look at it. They didn't know how to go about looking at it. Um, we had one researcher, John Carpenter, that pretty much was running it for, uh, for MUFON at the time. So we, what we did is we separated ourselves from MUFON as a separate entity. And we called ourselves CE4 Research. CE4, Boson County, fourth county. Okay. 
research, real simple, easy to remember, easy to say. The website that I still have today, ce4research.com. But we always made the information available to MUFON if they wanted to see it. We weren't going to keep anything secret. We wanted to make everything public. Thank you. We wanted to make sure that everything was available for peer review. And everything to this day has always been available for peer review. A lot of the work I put up on the website, I want everybody to see it. The, 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 the interviews that we've done, the testimonies that come in from people that are abduction experiencers, I try to get as many up there as I can. There's about 150 of them up there right now. But I've worked with easily in the past 20 years, upwards of five, 600 individuals that have had this experience. Let's stop right here. I want to give you guys an idea about what the experience does to these people. I've got a little video here. I've used it over the years. And it gives you a real good idea of what you can go through and how it affects them. All right. I'm going to bring the level down. I don't have a lot of time. Good morning, everybody. This is happening to you. And if you have any way, I didn't know the way that it happened to me, but it did. Joe's parents and her family believe that what happened to them was not an isolated incident. One highly controversial study conducted by the Rotary Club suggests that hundreds of thousands, even millions of Americans, have memories that indicate that they may have been kidnapped by the Abduction researchers believe these abductions happen generation after generation, as this family from West Springs, Missouri, attests. Their story starts when they moved in the fall of 1976 in the presumed safety of their home. I remember just lying there, trying to relax. I'd open my eyes and see a red light rolling across the ceiling, which it almost looked like the uh, Aurora Borealis. Dan and Joyce Aaron say the room was dark except for the unusual lights, which they describe as about four or five feet in diameter. They say it happened over the baby's crib, at the foot of their bed where their one year old daughter Heather slept. Dan says that when he tried to get up, he found himself immobilized. Like the most frightening feeling I've ever had in my whole life and something in the world. The incident was over in what seemed like an instant. The baby was standing up in the crib looking dazed but unharmed. Dan and Joyce thought they had just shared a scary dream. That is until 1992, 16 years later. Dan, a computer technician, was working at his keyboard when suddenly he was seized by panic. I immediately thought I was having a heart attack. I was sweating real bad. My ears were swaying. I just was real tight feeling in my ear. Dan was rushed to the emergency room where doctors ran tests and were x rays. When the results were in, they concluded that Dan had suffered an anxiety attack and sent him home. But the symptoms persisted. The feeling of that was devastating. Um, he couldn't move the house. He was so scared. After six weeks of constant fear, Dan sat down in front of the TV trying to relax. He turned on a movie that happened to be about alien abductions. Dan experienced a sudden revelation. There was one part in that movie that uh, this little creature, whatever, was kind of peeking up out from around the door. And it was in the dark and the shadows and what he said. And I immediately just, my heart started racing and I just kind of completely went out of it. You know, Dan wondered, was his anxiety somehow related to the subject of the movie? 
created chance to find another television show about it with Dutchies and wants to interview with therapist John Carpenter, the national director of abduction research for the mutual UFO network. Dan immediately contacted Carpenter for help. And he had flashbacks and nightmarish images of these beings that didn't understand what was going on and needed some relief. Dan agreed to an on-camera hypnosis session with Carpenter, during which he revisited that memorable night in 1976, the night he saw the red light over the baby's crib. This time, under hypnosis, he remembers more. He recalls cowering in the corner of his bed as he watched A and B from the front of heaven from the crib. What did he crib? He went to the crib. Under separate hypnosis, Dan's wife Joyce recalled the same sequence of events. They both said little beings marched from outside to get the family was floating on the station. I never wondered what happened to my children. I didn't realize until later that it happened. When they took her, I couldn't do anything. Heather. Now 22 and married, remembers a series of abductions beginning in childhood when she was forced to play telepathic games with the aliens. I didn't play the games. I can't trust that when you're in the crowd. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Aaron's family believes alien kidnappers have not only intruded in the lives of their children, but are now visiting one of their grandchildren. We called him his little boys that come in his room and fly. He said he wanted to watch the ship leave. I'm not going to tell him that it's not real because it is real. Skeptics would say that Dan, Joyce, and Heather could have constructed their stories together before hypnosis. But then they'd have to know how to answer the trick questions and the leading suggestions which I provide. Plus, there are many details they wouldn't know about that we would be looking for as markers for truthfulness and reliability of other abduction data. Researchers also believe abductees are sincere because of another consistently reported feature of abduction accounts. The insertion of alien implants. I uh, turned my head to the right and this tall being came over. And it kept telling me that it would be okay. But it doesn't even hurt me. And then it took this uh, very long needle and then put it up my right and Oh. And I closed my eyes and I had it touch. And then I became very calm. Objects said to be these implants have been recovered. MIT's David Pritchard has examined the composition of one of these reported implants in a laboratory and contends there is absolutely no physical proof of alien activity. If you don't find physical evidence and we have it, then we have to lump this in the category of fair results, near death experiences, people report, or we're going to be back to the days of the medicine men on the other side. With the help of hypnosis, Dan's anxiety subsided as he returned to work. But what once seemed out of this world has now become a part of his life. 
if this is some sort of mental thing that's happening to people, then why aren't they out? Why aren't the scientists or the doctors or whatever trying to find a cure? Why aren't they finding a cure, she asks. This is what all of them are asking. How do we make this stop? This is an experience that goes against the will of all of these experiences. They don't know when it's going to happen. They don't want it to happen. How many of you are parents in here or grandparents? Imagining it happening to your children and you can't do a thing about it. That's scary stuff. And that's what's going on with this experience. The more we started looking at this abduction experience amongst our group, our meeting group, the more we started seeing other things that work in line with the phenomenon. We started seeing that there seemed to be a spiritual aspect to the phenomenon. And I wasn't sure how it even tied in there, but it had markers that were showing up that something was involved. The people, as they started looking for answers and not knowing where to go, a lot of them got involved in paranormal studies or new age studies to try to find answers or, you know, Near Eastern religious studies or things like that, trying to find out what this experience was or if there was a way to put it behind them and take control of it. There was an aspect that Mufan was telling me not to get involved with, because Mufan was a nuts and bolts scientific investigative organization. They warned me stay away from getting involved with the paranormal and you know the, the new age side of the UFO phenomenon. If you go to UFO conferences, you're always going to see in the vendor areas these types of groups that are are made available. You know that sell their wares or whatever they're you know they have there. Um, it's a connection that I don't think that should be together, you know, for a scientific organization if they're gonna promote themselves that way. But even in the symposium I went to last year from MUFON, they were still there in the vendor area as usual, as most conferences that I go to. Uh, the ones that I've been here over the years, the same types of groups are still present. You got tarot card readers, fortune tellers, you know, crystal being sold, all that type of stuff. So there's some something driving these experiencers to be attracted to that type of study and that type of belief system. And I couldn't quite put my finger up. But I knew it was part of the experience and it was part of finding the answers. So I went looking at it myself. I spent the next four years getting involved in new age practices and studies and the esoteric teachings that are all involved in it to a point where I was part of it as they were. And I don't even remember how I got sucked in so quickly. But it gave me another perspective to be able to look at this phenomenon. Remember when I told you I first got into this, I was an agnostic humanist, okay? I had a set of glasses that I was looking through for a perspective on what this phenomenon looked like. Over the next four years, as I became involved in new age practices and the paranormal, it gave me another set of lenses to look through at this phenomenon and try to understand what was happening. 1996 rolls up, and something happened in my life. I got introduced to a number of different things. But I had a girlfriend at the time that was a professing Christian, but was working with me in the UFO and abduction research. And I'm glad she was because working with abductees, they're primarily female. And some of the information they want to share about their experiences, you need to make sure there's a woman in the room with you 
even if they give you permission to listen to them. Okay, there were some that they just needed to be a woman, period, to listen to the experiences. So I'm getting pretty personal. So I'm glad she was there to help me with this. But as some of the cases we got involved with, they were very dark, seemed to be very sinister type cases that we couldn't understand what was going on there, you know, clearly. And it troubled us. And she saw I was troubled. And she says, this one day, she says, uh, you know, you're getting into an area here that you really should have some type of protection. And I said, well, I got all my crystals here. This one protects me from this. And this one protects me from that. And uh, you know, I really believe that stuff. I have my little pouch. And she says, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about real protection. She says, I think what you're dealing with here is a spiritual phenomenon, you know, more than anything else. I said, I have no idea where you're going with this. And she says, well, I, I think you need to look at this. And she hands me a Bible. And I said, uh-uh. You know, I'm, I'm okay with you being a Christian and you're not. You seem to be fine with it. You don't push it on me. Uh, I said, I don't think that's got anything to do with this topic and area of study. She says, well, I think it does. I think you'll take a look at it. I said, now, well, next thing she called me for something I had said many times. I always bragged about being the most open-minded, objective investigator around. And she called me. She said, you know, you remember you used to say this? So how about we take a look at this? I said, all right, you got a few minutes. Show me what you want. Well, she showed me something in biblical scripture. I'd probably heard it a thousand times growing up in a Christian family, but never accepted the belief system. And I heard it in a way that just stunned me. And it was so clear. It's like a, a light bulb going off. And I said, you know, I want that kind of protection. And my life changed at that point. My belief system changed again. And I became a Christian in 1996, fall of 96. But I'm still a UFO investigator. I'm still an abduction researcher. It's okay, as far as I know. But I wanted to know also, what was a Christian? You know, now if you're calling me a Christian, what's a Christian? I'm still an inquisitive type person. Tell me what a Christian is. I had an opportunity to learn real fast. I had some people that helped me study and take me through Bible studies and try to understand what it was, what I was now. And along the way, I got the feeling that, you know what? Maybe I shouldn't be doing this abduction UFO stuff at all. Maybe this is something that's not really in line with being a Christian. But I thought, let's use this. Let's put the question out there. Because it's something that I wasn't seeing in the UFO realm. When you start looking and, and, at groups of people that are affected by the phenomenon, affected by being abductees, we thought it was running across the board pretty equal. So we figured we'd put out a, quest, a question, a hypothesis, and let's go after one question at a time. So I put the question out there as a new Christian. I said, are Christians being abducted by aliens? Good question to ask. Nobody else had been asking it. You know, I said, we got one new, let's go after that one. So we did. We started asking around, we started looking at all the different experiences, testimonies, started going back talking to them. What was interesting was the answer we got. We got a yes. And we got a no. Not just one answer, we got two answers. Didn't expect that one. What we had found was true walk the walk believers, Christian people that had a close walk with what scripture says, their belief in Jesus Christ, were absent from the experience as experiencers. But those that were professing Christians, let's say, with the mind, not with the heart, were still having 
themselves open to experience. You understand what I'm saying here? Okay, it was a walk the walk and a talk the talk. And there seemed to be something that was separating the two. So we decided to focus on that and let's find out why these ones that were with the walk the walk, why weren't they affected by this phenomenon? What was it they had that excluded them from being taken in the middle of the night? And their kids taken and their grandkids taken. What did they have that separated them from the rest of society? We had a piece of the puzzle that nobody was looking at. That unwanted piece of the puzzle, that's the one we decided to go after. We didn't know it was unwanted at the time. So we went after that piece. As a researcher, you've heard lots of different talks, people looking at different subjects. There's so many different aspects to the UFO abduction experience. You get it, you still got crop circles, you still got cattle mutilations, you still got all these other things going on that are part of this phenomenon. You can't cover it all. You can try, but you're only going to get a little bit to bits and pieces. What's good if you take one piece and go after it and try to complete it to see if it even belongs on the table for the picture to come to a whole picture. That's what we've done. We've taken one piece and gone after it. We came across one of our cases. We were interviewing <clears throat> where the guy is recalling an experience. Now, this guy is not a walk the walk believer, he's a brand new believer. The guy starts out telling me, he says, Understand that, you know, I don't want to be involved in this stuff. You know, because I'm a Christian, and you know, it's like he thinks it's a taboo thing. But he says, I had an experience, a vivid experience, right after I became a Christian. Okay, and so he's a brand new believer learning in the beginning, like myself was at the time. But he recalls an experience where during the experience, he calls out, Jesus, Jesus, help me, or Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And abruptly the experience stops and he wakes up in bed, wakes his wife up. And it was so vivid in his mind. When I heard that, I said, that's not possible. It's not possible. Why do I say that? Because every other researcher that we had read their work on said it's not possible to stop these experiences. They still say that today. They don't know why the experiences happen. To certain people, they don't, and they say they can't be stopped. Okay, so here I've got an experiencer that's telling me he stopped an experience. Is he real? Is he telling the truth? I don't know. So I decided let's go find out. So I call up these other top researchers that I had been in contact with doing abduction research at the time, some of the top ones that we had in the country. And I said, guys, I got this case, and I don't know what to make of it. And I said, I want to share it with you and see if you guys can help me out. And I, they all said, share the story. So I'd share the story with them, the guy's experience. And they'd all go, uh, can we go off the record? I said, sure, just help me out. Give me some in, you know, enlightenment on this. How can I deal with this? Every one of them said, we had come across cases like that also, where people are either in prayer, singing a hymn, quoting scripture, or just calling out in the name of Jesus, had been able to stop an experience, okay? And I said, well, wait a minute. You guys have never stated that that was possible. Next thing I hear from them was, we didn't know what to make of it, okay? I would have settled for that. Sure, you don't know what to make of it. But you still need to talk about it. You still need to tell people that something's happening. And I question them on that. The last thing they said, each of them, we were afraid it might affect our credibility in the realm. So we didn't go there. So they knew this. People that we were relying on for the truth had already come across this, but decided not to share the information. 
What's that called? <laughs> Isn't that a cover up? Yeah. From the people that were relying on for the truth. I had no problem with it. I was still going to continue with what I was doing. It made me a little mad at these guys, but I understood their positions. I told them, we're going off the phone. I said, guys, I'm going to take this and I'm going to run with it. Because now you've let me know that I'm on the right track. There are other cases like this. I'm going to document that. I'm going to take this piece of the puzzle and I'm going to make it known. And they all said the same thing. Please do, because we can. In the 20 years that I've been working on this, they've never come against me in my research. Others that I've never talked to, that I haven't talked to, yeah, they got real angry about it. So I knew there were more cases. It wasn't long before I actually got to hear it two or three more when people said that they had done that. So now we really know that yes, you can stop this experience. And there seems to be a commonality on how it can be stopped. I didn't ask for this. All I did is ask one question Can Christians be abducted by aliens? Okay. The people we were talking about, the people that have come to us, and said, I've had these experiences, I've been able to stop and use them this way, okay? These are the talk-to-talk -talk believers. I've still yet to hear from a walk-to-walk -walk believer that's even had an experience, okay? That's still, that's another side of this. We decided to put this information out there right in the beginning to see if we can let people know that we had come across this and we were looking for more people to be able to share that if there were more out there. First thing we did, we got an opportunity for an article in the local newspaper. Two weeks into that article being published locally, I started getting calls coming in from all over the country. It happened to be that the Florida Today newspaper that ran the article for us was an affiliate of Gannett Publications. Okay, Gannett was nationwide, <laughs> had affiliates all over the country. So that article ran everywhere. And the people were calling me saying, I gotta tell you, I've stopped that experience by using the name of Jesus. And I said, I'm looking at you know the ID caller, this is back before cell phones. And I'm going, well, your ID caller says you're calling from Nebraska. I said, what do you mean that's your local paper? I said, this ran in my local paper. No, it's in my local paper. And that's when I went back and called Florida today. And I said, oh, that article ran all over the country. So I got cases coming in from all over telling me that what we had found was a real thing. Okay. Now we've got the 50 cases that I've got where people said that yes, I've used the name and authority of Jesus Christ to stop the abduction experience. And I'm thinking, oh my, where's this going? Right after that, um, it hit the internet. Um, Michael, Michael Lindemann back in the early days had a news, UFO news thing on the early internet. And he picked it up from the Gannett paper, put it on his service, it went worldwide on the internet right away, okay? Now I got people emailing from all over saying that yes, I too have done that. Next thing it was picked up by Flying Saucer Review out of England, one of the most notable UFO mags that had been around for decades. Now, it's since deceased, and I think Philip Manilover in England has now got the access to it, the, the old archives. But we made it a flying saucer review, the article that was in our local paper. We printed it just the way the newspaper printed it. And I thought, oh my, this, this has reached worldwide to where we got it out there, didn't cost us anything, it just took off. In the past, 15 or so years that this information has been out there, these testimonies have come in by the hundreds. The hundreds. They still come in. I live in South Korea. I still got my same email I've been running for 15 years or more. Testimonies are still coming in on a weekly basis. It becomes the question is, 
how many does it take for you to see that this is a real thing? These people have been able to stop this experience using this one particular method. In the research, we've asked other questions over the years. People say, well, what about, you know, other spiritual entities? You know, is, is any of the other names work? And I'm going, I don't have anything that shows that. I don't have people that have been able to stop this experience in the name of Allah or Buddha or Krishna. I don't have any of those. I challenge people to bring them to me if you do. But I don't. Okay. <laughs> There's only seems to be this one. You're starting to understand why it's the unwanted piece of the puzzle now. It's not really something that the UFO community wants to settle for. This leads to a whole bunch of questions. What is this phenomenon? Really, if that name stops the experience. What are we dealing with here? And why only that name? See, more questions. Over the years, we started looking at some other things too. You know, a lot of the researchers will tell you if you listen to their talks, you know, this UFO phenomenon and this abduction phenomenon is it's a worldwide event. You know, it, it's something that's happening worldwide. I used to accept that. I thought this was going on everywhere. I took it for granted. These guys were telling us, yeah, it's, it's, it's go, this goes on in other countries too. Well, you know, I got to actually live in another country. And when I moved to South Korea, first thing I was looking at is what's going on here? Nothing. It isn't happening everywhere. My job takes me to Japan. Very little going on there. But more than Korea. Other countries in the Southeast Asia. You might see one here, one sighting there. As far as the abduction goes, not here. Why is it? Why is it? I started asking that question. I started talking to the Korean people. I have lots of Korean friends. I tell them what I work in, they laugh. They know about the UFO phenomenon. They know about abductions. They watch American TV. They watch movies. They know what it's about. But when you ask them, what do they think of it? First word out of their mouth. And almost everyone on the tell you the same thing. I'm not gonna. What? I don't have time for that. That's their honest answer. And you know what? They're telling you the truth. South Korea, in 60 years, has come so far in their growth of technology and industry. They are striving to be world dominant technology. They want to beat the heck out of the Japanese, believe me. And the amazing thing is, it's hard for me to come back here to America and get poor internet. I hate that. It's so fast though. Okay. You know, everything is, you know, everything is, is fiber optic. There's not an inch of ground in the entire South Korea that you don't have signal. And it's 4G, you know, and they're talking about going faster. You know, it's amazing what they've done. But you know what it takes to do that? Work. Hard work. That's why they're busy. The Korean kids go to school 10, 12, 13, 14 hours a day. They jump off buildings when they don't get the entry to the college of their choice. It's that competitive. They are too busy. You're either working already, you're running a business, or you're in school so you can work and run a business to be world successful, okay? They wanna be so much like us, it's incredible. I warn them all the time, no, no, no. You wanna be 
successful. You don't want to be like us. Okay. That's Korea. They're too busy. No time to get involved. I've done 20 trips to Tokyo for my job over the past five years. I got to know the Japanese people that I work with. I got to know their families. It's my home away from home. I start talking to them about this. Japan, to me, looking at it compared to Korea, seems to be about 30 years more advanced than Korea. We've had a little more time at this since the World War II, not just from the Korean War. They have a little bit of time in their hands. They still want to be successful too. But they've gotten to where they've achieved a good amount of success and they're starting to relax. And they're starting to do what with their spare time? Look at things, question things. Dreams don't have time yet. Japan has a little bit of time. Now, let's step across the ocean to America. Americans don't want to work full time. Do you really? Anybody really want to work full time? No, we're past that. We're pretty much settled into where we want free time. What do you do with your free time? You're looking at crazy stuff. Yeah, we do. We don't spend it full time with family because you've only got a little bit of time. We spend a little bit of time with family, but the rest of the time is looking at crazy stuff. Driven by Hollywood, driven by the press. So I had to put all this together. So when it comes down to it, is all of this based on time in your hands? Could this whole phenomenon be related to how much time you got to look at it? I love reading Nick Redfern's blogs. And he wrote one just recently where he was talking about how people that get involved looking at these things, eventually some of them become experiencers. Okay. A lot of that is how this happens. This was talked about 20 years ago. Um, there's a Wuhan Journal article that came out talking about that. Somebody else had talked that 20 some years ago that some of the leading researchers and investigators at the time, the more and deeper they got involved, they ended up being experiencers themselves also. It was a danger they were warning about. So we're back to that. Is this something that you open up to instead of? them doing it against you. <laughs> the question that they keep asking most researchers in the abduction realm, why does this happen to some people? They don't have answers for it yet. They haven't been able to pinpoint what is that commonality. In the research and working with the experiences that I've worked at worked with over the years, I found three answers. And it could be any one of the three or a combination of the three. But what we found looking at the experiencer's testimonies and talking to them or the ones I've worked with, one, they ask for it. You're thinking, what? People ask for this? You have no idea. Set up a vendor table at one of these conferences, just put out anything that says abductions. And they come by and they go, man, I'd like to, I'd like to have that so I can know what it's about. <laughs> Be careful what you ask for. But yeah, there's people that ask for. Number two, that's just a few people. Though. Number two, there are people that unknowingly open the door to. Them. What's that door? That commonality door seems to be involvement in. The paranormal or the occult. There seems to be a commonality amongst experiencers where at some point they were involved in that, unknowingly allowing the door to open that the experience could happen to them. And the third one, 
Bergman puzzled me for a while. I didn't know how to get an answer for that one. But I had adults coming to me saying, I've had that experience since I was a child. I didn't ask for that. I didn't even know what to ask for. And I definitely was too young to even understand what paranormal or occult was to unknowingly open that door. So how did it happen to me? Well, as we were looking at this from, remember, a Christian perspective now, um, looking through my Christian lenses, I went to scripture and started seeing if there was any relationship there that might answer that question. Because the secular researcher says it's a, it's a inherited thing genetically passed through the family. I don't believe that. What we found by going back and talking to the experiencers is as a child, they didn't open the door. But as I started talking to them and asking them, what was your family like? Yet? What do you remember about your parents and what they were involved in? How we found the open door came from the parents. It's not a genetic trait following families. It's an open door following families. Scripture, Christian scripture talks about the spiritual, if this is a spiritual event, the spiritual head of the household is the man, the father. He holds the spiritual covering and protection over the family. If he's not doing that, you got an open door. That's what we're finding in the testimonies and the research. Okay. That's why the kids are being affected. And that's why it continues, because they don't know how to stop it. But we have now learned through testimony after testimony after testimony after testimony, hundreds of them, that we have a common factor that people are able to stop the experience. One thing that people are looking for when they're looking for answers is a repeatable event. Can you call down the UFO repeatedly to make sure people can see it and take pictures of it? Nobody's done it yet. A guy named Prophet Yahweh tried. Uh, if you guys know who he is. Uh, but he's not real successful either. In his mind, he is. But this event, this helping people stop an experience, because that's what happened is as we started posting these testimonies, people started coming to us as experiencers and saying, I read that these people were able to stop their experiences and get their lives back. Can you help me do that? I'm going, oh my, I didn't know that it was going here. You know, I never expected that part of this to come up. But it did, and we had to answer to that. And we said, well, if we take what these people are saying that they've done, I think we can help you. I think you can help yourself. And you know what? It works. It's a repeatable event. If you are one of these experiencers that would like your life back, if you ask us, we can show you, and we can pretty sure help you get your life back. It's a repeatable event. It's the only one that we've come across. Starting to see why it's an unwanted piece of the UFO puzzle. This goes against everything else out there in the UFO realm. Because what this is pointing at is not an ET event. It's pointing at this is a spiritual event that people open the doorway for it to happen and come into their life. Okay? And there's one name that seems to be able to make it go away. And these people get their lives back. This is what this research has shown. No other name, no other belief system. One way, and it works. And we've had testimony after testimony after testimony after testimony. I vouches for that. Plus, 
the idea that maybe this is about time on your hand. Because you've given that time on your hand. Was it, there's a scripture that talks about idle hands. Was it, Josh? You know? Yeah, there you go. Workshop. Yeah, devil's workshop. So maybe that's true. Maybe if you scripture that we believe as Christians is actually real. Maybe what we're dealing with here is not ET at all. That's what this conference is about, right? Challenges to the ET hypothesis. This is a challenge. Maybe this is really just a spiritual attack. Why the attack? Why this guy's? Why manifest in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the picture of, a, of an ET? Why? Because it's easily accepted. You wouldn't accept elves and fairies of, of old. They showed up now. But you would accept something that's high technology. And that's what is the attraction in this realm. People are looking for a savior in this realm. They just don't want the savior that came before. I can stand up here and say, trust me in all of this. I've got testimonies posted. You can say, ah, he made those up. He posted them up there. He's pushing some kind of Christian agenda. I'm not, I didn't ask for this. This is what I ended up with. This is the puzzle that I chose, not knowing where it was going. And this is what I ended up with. I can show you fuzzy pictures of so called UFOs. I got lots of those. Does that prove anything? No. Where's the proof in the pudding? That's what you need to see. Okay. Remember that lady I had up here and her family? That story ran, that video ran on sightings for 10 years. Every year I saw that family over and over and over. I thought, man, only they had an opportunity to be helped. You know what happened one day? It was a Sunday night. It was back. And it was the last ever episode of X Files. I told my wife, nobody is to bother me <laughs> until this show is over. Guess what? I get a phone call. My wife comes in, computer room. Uh, you need to take this. No. It's X Files last show. <laughs> no, I need to take this call. Amazing call. Some gal wanted to tell me how she was this huge experiencer. Okay? And I thought, come on, I could have done this after the show. But I listened to her for about 45 minutes. Telling me all about her experiences and everything that her and her family have been through. And I made a, I said, I can't get you off this phone. And I'm uh, thinking to myself. But I realized at the end of the call that what was happening was I was starting to discern that she was very upset. She wasn't bragging about the experiences, she was telling me, looking for answers and looking for hope. You know, so I said, we need to meet. So I set it up in a neutral place, a little restaurant nearby, because she happened to be local. Uh, she found my name in the paper because um, one of the local writers, Billy Cox, uh, he writes for the Herald Tribune now over in St. Pete. Um, he used to write for the Today paper. I always wrote articles about me being a MUFON guy for Bar County. Well, he wrote an article for the last show for MUFON, came out that morning in the Sunday paper, and he went and put where I live. So this guy was able to figure out and get my phone number, you know, from the, from the uh, yellow pages, white pages, yellow pages, and gives me this call and wants to tell me, you know, that's how all this comes out. So we ended up meeting up. And I was going to share with her, you know, 
I could tell she was not a happy person. I was going to do what I could to offer her what I had already learned at that time. And you know what? We sat there and I, I explained everything to her at this little restaurant. And all of a sudden, she just freaks and up and out the door. I thought, yeah, it's the end of that one. I tried. <laughs> you know? But then I get a phone call a few days later. He says, we need to talk. I need your help. And you know, I told you, I'm not going to bring you fuzzy pictures. I'm not going to tell you, trust me, you don't know me. But I am going to bring you living real evidence. And that's the testimonies. Okay? First one I want to bring up is Guy Malone. Guy Malone, come on. If you guys don't know his story, it's in his book, Come Sail Away with me. It's over there on the desk. Guy Malone is a testimony. He's evidence to what I've been telling you is this piece of the puzzle. Used to be an experiencer, free through the name and authority of Jesus Christ. Evidence. Okay. How about another? The girl I was just talking about? The girl in the video. The one that said that they would just get a cure. Choice. This is her. Amen. Amen. Guys, this is evidence. Okay? Talk to them. Because nobody else does. Every time I do this talk, and I'm able to bring testimony up, I say, this is the evidence. Challenge the evidence. Nobody does. I don't know, are they afraid to? You sure scrutinize a fuzzy picture when you get it. But I give you real life change. And their families will testify to this, you know, that they have changed. Not only is Joyce changed, but her husband came to the truth. Her son came to the truth. He was baptized here in Roswell. He came, what was that, 2009, I think? And uh, amazing how this this family, they've never shown the rest of the story. You're seeing the rest of that story that aired for 10 plus years over and over asking for help. She got the help. No more experiences. No more fear. Got her life back. So this guy. And there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds more. You want to hear what the researchers say about this? Play an audio clip. This is from one of the leading researchers out there. This is what they say about this, without questioning these people at all. So the number of conference since the last year with um, other you know, students, mothers, and we've done things like question and answers with the audience, and almost every time somebody's asked you know, about the abductions, and there's a seems to be a lot of indication that. When people have said, you know, in the name of Jesus, that the abductions have stopped. Um, do you have any ideas about that? Does this yeah. connect with the biblical sense of fallen angels? You know, yeah, I get that all the time. Yeah, all the time. Uh, and, and, um, in the first place, um, uh, people say in the name of Jesus, I command you to stop, and then the abduction is over. Here's the problem. I number one, I've worked with five ministers. The abductions didn't stop. We'll just leave that to the side. <laughs> uh, but um, the other problem is this. People think, well, if somebody remembers something in without hypnosis, that's going to be a lot stronger and a lot more and a lot truer and a lot less shaky than memory with hypnosis because people are suggestible, they're vulnerable. Uh, the hypnotist uh, doesn't know what he's uh, doing or saying and, and, and puts the same ideas in their minds and all that, that stuff. The truth of the matter is, is that conscious memories are notoriously inaccurate. It is usually a particle of truth 
a massive confabulation, another particle of truth, more confabulation. Now the story about saying the word Jesus or throwing a pillow at them as they came through the window and then they retreated. I hear that once in a while. This is what actually happens. The person was in bed, let's just say, or whatever. It doesn't really matter. And uh, these bees come in, they take her out, they take her out into the audio, do this and that, this and that, this and that. She, she, she messes with kids, she does this, she does a whole bunch of things, other things on. And they bring her back. And then uh, she forgets about it uh, immediately. And, uh, and, and she gets into bed and all that, except for one thing. She comes to, she sort of becomes awake a little too soon. And they're in the process of leaving. And she sees them and she thinks, oh my God, they're going to come to a deathmate and then Jesus are connected to go. And sure enough, she prevented the abduction as they leave. That's what they have said. It's not the other way around that they came in. People who are Jewish, people who are Muslim, people who have other religions, maybe whatever, uh, uh, they're all abducted too. It doesn't matter. I hate to say it. I wish there was an easy answer, but I wish there was an answer that worked. Uh, but um, that's what happens uh, uh, in my experience. In other words, uh, they'll tell me that they stopped the abduction and will do a session on it. And it turns out they didn't stop the abduction and they figured out themselves, oh, they were leaving when I threw that pill out. It didn't even occur to them that it was already over. But uh, so we, we have to be very careful with conscious memory. I learned that the hard way. I, I, I used to think God conscious memory, that's, that's, the, that's the gold standard. In fact, it's the fool's gold standard if I might point out how grace. He's never talked to these testimonies. Okay. Remember, I told you that the ones that I first talked to in the beginning never came against the research because they understood this. They actually had cases themselves. He doesn't get these. I've talked to him. Okay. This is one that will do everything he can to make sure he hangs on to what he's got. All these other people, again, you heard it again. It's happening all over Muslims, Hindus, whatever, all having these experiences. No, they're not. This is an American thing, primarily American, some European. The numbers are here, just like with the sighting reports. Look at the MUFON statistics. You get 500 reports a month coming in, a month from this country. Two biggest states, California and Florida. And then it gets dwindles down to nothing. For some states, it's nothing at all. This is not happening everywhere to everybody, like they say. They use that, okay? And you accept that. We need to stop accepting that. Look and do the research yourself. Ask the questions. You'll find it. It's not the way it is. It's not the way they're saying it is, okay? The whole idea about not trusting conscious memory, <clears throat> no. Let me tell you something. I, I did some work on this with these experiences. I can sit any of you down and I can say, we're going to have a talk. You're going to tell me about a birthday. Let's just pick your last birthday. You guys remember your last birthday? Who doesn't? There might be a couple of us that are old enough that we don't want to, but pretty much we actually remember your last birthday. I can sit you down. I don't use hypnosis, but I know how to ask the right questions. I'm a safety professional in my work, okay? I have to learn how to ask the right questions to get to a root cause analysis of what caused an accident to happen. You have to know how to ask the right questions. I don't need the hypnosis to find out why a guy slammed a hammer on his finger. I need to get it and ask the right questions. So I'll ask you the right questions. Tell me about your last birthday. And I'll just keep asking and asking and asking and asking. So I run out of questions. But you're going to remember more than you ever thought you remember, okay? If I ask you the right question, you'll remember. You'll remember the temperature. If you're in a room, I'll get you to remember that temperature of the air conditioning, whether it was on or not. Did you feel it blowing? 
or you're standing on carpet, there's a thicker fin. These are things you weren't thinking of when you were enjoying your birthday. But if I ask you the right questions, it'll trigger the real conscious memory that you'll have the right answers and you'll relive that experience to a, an effect that you'll go, wow, that's so much bigger than the day I lived in. Okay? Those conscious memories are there and they are clear and they are recorded. But these experiences with guys like that, the way this works in almost every case, because I deal with this, is people will come to me, I've had these dreams, and they're looking for an answer. They've already had a dream, and that's what they call it. Okay? And their the dream is so much like that TV show I watched. Didn't we hear this with our husband? We related it to watching communion. Whitley Streeter's story. He had another anxiety attack. He set himself up. Carpenter didn't do anything to make suggestions. I've read the transcripts. They gave them to me to read. Carpenter didn't ask any leading questions. Okay? They set themselves up by automatically connecting this dream or this reaction to a TV show to something that Hollywood had produced saying, well, this must be, this might be what this is. I need to go ask somebody about it, find out if this is what's really happened. So they went to their the regular doctor, right? That's where you go when you're experiencing, you're having weird memories. You go talk to your doctor. How do you know you don't talk to your doctor? You can end up in a rubber room or on some serious medication. So who do you go see? A UFO hypnotist? You've already suggested the story to yourself. You set yourself up. You want to hear that story. Not just that. We know there's a spiritual aspect of this phenomenon, a deceptive aspect of this phenomenon. That's the door you just opened. They're going to attach itself to it. They're going to feed you with that, whatever story it needs to take to turn you around. To turn you around for what? Okay? Mike Kaiser talks about this in one of his talks. What he believes this is, and I kind of agree with him on this, this whole entire UFO abduction phenomenon is about changing a mindset. That's what this is. That's the purpose, is to change your world view. And it does it to everybody, okay? It's to take our eyes away from the one true God. The end result is what we deal with with these experiences, okay? That's why they open up into a new religion, a new, new age practices that go along with it. This is what happens. So these are the findings of CE4 research. We're still looking into this. There's still new things coming about we're looking at. But what that guy, Dr. David Jacobs, says, uh -uh. so what he talked to five pastors. I've talked to hundreds of pastors that still have no clue what we're talking about because they haven't looked at it either. We're here to try to educate them also so that they can help people. They're the ones that should be helping people. That's what the churches are there for. But it takes people like us, people like yourselves, to finally get to hear and understand what this is about, to take it back and help share with them so that we can make this change. This is a cultural change, primarily for Western civilization. We're not seeing this in other countries. Other countries have their own little problems, their own paranormal activities. Instead of alien abductions, it seems to be something related to their culture. Okay? But this one seems to be fitting ours. The unwanted piece of the UFO puzzle. Most people don't want to hear this. Not in the UFO realm. But thank you for sitting through it. You've heard it. I have some questions for you to be back. Okay. We're going to open up to some questions. You guys want to go first, and then I'll ask the questions from the web. He's got people online that have just watched this live. 
and they're in other parts of the world. They have postures oh, too. Zealand, Canada, shout out. Yeah. <laughs> Australia, New Zealand, Canada. Hey, looking to hear from you. This opens up a lot of questions, I'm sure. Um, these two are going to move off for now. Uh, if I need them, I'll call them back up okay. for a question. But question the evidence, okay? Talk to them. They're the ones that have been through this. They're the ones that got their lives back. They're the ones that testify on how it happened, okay? That's the evidence right there. I don't really have a question, but over the last year, I've been a very avid looking into the phenomenon. And uh, it does seem like it's demonic. And that was my ace, my ace in the hole was uh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I heard one one person say, uh, ask them if they believe in my You know, that's actually how. Um, where people said that they've been asked that question by the entities themselves, or they've asked the entities that themselves. The answer is yes. They know who he is. You know, the enemy, the enemy, the Christian perspective, the enemy is Satan and his minions. Of course they know who he is. They know he's, he's their doom. Yes. I've, I've known about you for years and years, and I'm a member of MUFON in Missouri. Mm -hmm. And it amazes me whenever I, I, there's several people that are experiencers. And when I try to talk to them about you and Jesus, they're not interested. No, they're not. They're, they're really not. And, and I find that really frustrating. Really frustrating. These are the people that got the sign up and said, oh, there is the sign right there. I want to believe. <laughs> this this whole thing is really a, a, a pseudo religion for them. For people that have that sign and have that motto, this has become their religion in every aspect. Yes. During your tenure as an investigator, can you give us a percentage of the stories? For that you have confirmed, not confirmed, or refuted? As far as what? As whether or not they're, they're true or viable. I can tell you what I come across in the research, and it's pretty much the same thing as what the other researchers have come across. Looking at the UFO phenomenon first, I'm going to give you both so you understand. UFO phenomenon, 98% of sightings are just misidentified, either natural phenomenon or aerial phenomenon that's just been misidentified, okay? We just don't have enough information to clarify exactly what they did see, but most of it is misidentified. Natural phenomenon or man-made, 98% right out the door, okay? Don't need to focus on those. You got enough information to realize that that's where that's going. It's that down to that 2% that causes a problem. The real problem is not enough information at all to really get an answer on it, or there seems to be some kind of paranormal nature to it, and they don't know how to investigate that, okay? To the point where last year when I went to the Buffon Symposium, I was hearing a term that I'd never heard before. It was the first time back in the country in five years. And I, I went to the symposium, I was in Orlando, and I tied it in to visit the family back there in Lamar County. But I'm in the, I'm in the, you know, the symposium there, and the term that kept getting thrown around was, was it a real UFO or not a real UFO? Uh, what? What does that mean? It, it, it doesn't even make sense to say that. A UFO, one, is identified. It's either unidentified or it's identified. There's only two. Not what is a real UFO or not real UFO. What they're trying to do is because they can't answer to the paranormal aspects of a sighting, they're trying to separate it. They're trying to say a real UFO 
is something nuts and bolts compared to something that is not like something that's just a glowing red whatever fuzzy something okay that's doesn't not that we know that's not nuts and bolts that's something else don't know that. and the, the other thing is just too the terminology that's been used against us in this realm is just incredible um how many times have you ever heard in the time that you studied ufos somebody say ufos are real Yes, yeah, stupid that sounds. You really think about what's being said? Of course they're real. Of course people see things that they don't know what they are. What they're trying to really say, and they're trying to get your thinking to say, see, they tried to change your thinking for you. They want you to think when they say UFOs are real, you're automatically thinking it's extraterrestrial. But no, that's not, unless you're one of those people that follow that sign. But if you're a real investigator and researcher, you can't say that, okay? That's the dumbest thing to say, UFOs are real. Uh, we know that. Tell me what they are. But they don't do that. They let you assume what they're talking about is that you trust them without having to say it. This is a conditioning that we've all been put through by, I don't know who started this stuff, you know? Now when you get Stanton Friedman and says, client saucers are real, that's a whole nother story, okay? He's being specific. But yet we don't have evidence for that either. We do have evidence of UFOs are real, we don't have evidence of client saucers are real. Abductions, same thing with abductions. The first thing that 98% of them say, I had this dream. You could have stopped right there. But no, we get them excited. What was the dream like? Almost oh, like this, like this movie I saw, like this TV show I saw. We, we're setting these people up, okay? For whatever purpose, to change the mindset. But that's where a lot of this comes from. You have people that have mental issues that will tag on to anything and everything to get attention. Believe me, I've worked with a lot of those. You've got to, just, you've got to get those out of the, the picture right away because they'll, they'll drain you. You got those that drug induced situations, you've got to be able to discern that too. I'll take you back. I'll be honest. I'm, a, I'm not going to lie to you guys. In my younger days, drugs and alcohol, no problem. A lot of us have been there. A lot of us grew up. Don't do them anymore. You see things on drugs? Oh, yeah, you do. Oh, yeah, you do. I know that that can affect the way you think and what you believe. I know that it is an experience can be so real. And that's another thing you hear. I know that I saw it. People, how many times have you been told that? When people talk about an experience or seeing something. <clears throat> no, you really don't know what you saw. You can't tell me what you saw. You know, what they're trying to tell you is, I saw that. But they didn't. But that's all they can think. That's all they can grasp at. They haven't given them anything else. I hope I've given you something else. That it doesn't have to be ET, and I hope these guys, and these other speakers, are giving you something else. That it doesn't have to be ET. It can be something else. It can be man-made. It can be natural occurrence. It can be a drug-induced situation. Okay. It can be illness, or it could be a spiritual aspect to it. There's a lot of parts of it. When you get down to the abduction experience, a very small amount of it. I think is actually the experience itself that's destroying these people's lives. It's not a large amount. Okay? It doesn't take a lot to turn a person's life upside down. As far as the abductions being a physical experience, no evidence of it at all. I do not believe in any way that it's a physical experience. These are not physical entities that we're dealing with. This is what this whole conference is about. This is not ET. There is no ET. 
ET went home. <laughs> you know, the one thing that I like about what I've seen here at Roswell compared to what I've seen over the years, come here, what I hope you take back from this is an opportunity to enjoy fiction again. Okay? You go down here to these guys in Galacticon, they're happy people. You come into these conferences, most of them aren't. Because they've had something that is, that's turned their lifestyle upside down. And it's controlled them in a way that they don't know how to get it back. Okay? That line I told you in the beginning between fiction and nonfiction has become blurred. Doesn't need to be blurred. It's still black and white, definitely. All of this stuff that we blurred into it, we think is a reality, it's still fiction. And it's fiction in a way that it's allowed people to be affected by a spiritual force that can destroy them. I have a question from Bill Martin. Uh, we would like to know if you have any information on your web page uh, just about how many parents out of all the parents that were involved in paranormal stuff, in other words, if they were in the Indian calls or whatever, um, how many of their children have suffered? Is it one for one? Is it one to ten? You know, that, that I don't have it on the website. Right at this moment, the website's been stagnant for a while. I have somebody that works for the website, but the website's been in transition, so I haven't updated it in a while. Good question, Bill. I will get that answer up there for you. But what I'm seeing in the testimonies that I've worked with, which have been about five, 600 over the past 20 years, it's running about a third of them can remember having experiences that in their memory, saying they happened in their childhood. And every one of those has been related to the parents. Every time I can pinpoint exactly that it goes back to it's been an open door because of the parents. Well, can I hijack this for one second? I just wanted to add something uh, real quick. Uh, let me grab my microphone. It's right here. So we still got a friend to sure. That's good. That's perfect. So and I just wanted to add one thing really quick. Um, I've been a Christian for 25 years, and you know, the, the Bible does talk about spiritual battles, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. There's stuff going on that you cannot see in other dimensions, basically, that, that you know, whether you believe that or not is irrelevant. But for 25 years, I never had to deal with anything like Anything weird ever, you know, nuts and bolts is, is what he was talking about. And when I talked to Guy about coming down, doing the web broadcasting, uh, putting the stuff up on DVDs and getting the information out there right away, weird, I mean, really weird stuff. For instance, the, the night that we committed to me coming here and he was going to, you know, take care of the expenses and whatever. It was a snowy day in North Dakota. There's no wondering about that. Um, and the back gate is uh, like a real flimsy piece of metal. It's just held together with like some banding wire or whatever. Um, and it started rattling like somebody was trying to break in or, or, or get over it. It scared my daughter so bad. She was on the stairwell. She shot up like a flight of stairs in less than half a second. Um, and her dogs started barking at there wasn't anything there. They were barking, but there was nothing there. So uh, the next day, I had my pastor pray about it, and all of this, and he has a special group, and all of this ended. That was my first experience with weird stuff that cannot be explained. That's not an alien doing that. We went out the next morning, and again, it snowed, and there's no footprints in the gate, but it was rattling really bad, like somebody had, had really tried to break in. Um, and you know, I mean, and then I can tell you about all the crazy stuff that happened. I won't go into it, but this barely went off. This this broadcasting thing barely went off. Just one obstacle after another. 
health problems uh, right up to the end, about 10 minutes before they started yesterday. It was a giant question mark <laughs> as to whether or not it was going to go. So I just wanted to add my own experience to that. Um, like I said, I, I, I've been a Christian for 45 years, but I've never had to do anything weird or spiritual or, or anything like that. So I just wanted to add that. There are people who, or things being, that don't want this information out there. So I'll give it back to Joe there. Thanks. Any more questions from the uh, online guys? No. Anybody else? Well, I thank you guys for coming. Um, I don't know how far you come. I came a long way. I was glad to be here. Glad to have this opportunity. Um, I've had a chance over the years to talk here. Uh, but this one was special. I, I talked at the 60th. I gave this talk then. Um, had testimonies up there then. Nobody talked to them. Nobody questioned them. You know, they're afraid to. Um, like I said, they'll go after a fuzzy picture with a million dollars worth of equipment. But when it comes to this piece of the puzzle, they are so afraid to talk to the experiencer themselves, the actual evidence. And I think they're actually afraid that what I'm telling you could actually be true. And if it is true, which I believe it's true, and they believe it's true, the experiencers believe it, that it would change their lives. And I think that's what they're afraid of. And it, it's sad because it would change their life for a good thing, you know. Well, I thank you all. You got the clip? Yeah, it's right here. That was no big deal. It happens. It's a wide bed. It's not a studio. Right, right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.